get these thing, amazing things that you notice with time lapse, such as in this situation, this incredible life of light inside the building that you don't perceive in normal time. So one of this is, and this is relates to, somewhat to what Hugh was saying, is that there's a whole life to environment that time lapse reveals to us, and that's typically very exciting and interesting in the dome because it's in immersivity. So we're immersed in this expansive space, but also in a different sort of temporal context as well, which can be explored in different ways. And then this is again this, this sort of an interesting issue here with artifacts. The camera's quite close to these shelves, obviously, and so they, they loom enormously above you as you rotate around this room. So that's just an example of the type of uh, material I was generating there. This is uh, using some interesting software that I'm just messing around with. This is an equally rectangular projection taken into some software that you can download for free called Panini, and it explores the Panini projection which was a sort of uh, a reverse engineered type of projection from the paintings of Canaletto, who was a, a, a Venetian painter of the 17th or 18th century, <coughs> I think, who typically did these sort of architectural <coughs> landscape paintings of Venice that, uh, that, that dealt very successfully with the, uh, the verticality of lines in wide angle images, which is much more akin to how we perceive the world, as opposed to the distortions that you get in photographic imagery. And uh, this is a piece of software which I've just done a screen cap from here, and it sort of creates an interesting uh, feeling of actually flying physically around this room. You can imagine that the camera's orbiting around this room, but it's not actually moving at all. This is really just a geometric remapping of this equally rectangular image, much like the first image that we saw. And the point of this, I, I guess I would make, is that you can explore all sorts of interesting spatial effects through software remapping. Um, that are, are not explicitly derived from camera movements and so on. So okay, this now, this is an example of some of the material that I got from the Hurley Hobby. Um, it will be interesting to work with this type of imagery because the, like, this is an example of where the, the camera's moving uh, over a period of, you know, about an hour or so along down the side of Mawson's huts here. This, guy, this of course, will be right at the azimuth of the dome, right above you, if you're in a flat dome, or at, let's say about 60 degrees in the horizon dome. Um, and of course, if this was in the eye dome up front, all this would be chopped off here. So this is an example where you're shooting for a particular type of dome situation. So this is my mate Chris, who's the doctor and, and engineer. And uh, we built these uh, stereoscopic aerial rigs to fly cameras around. And this is the sort of material that we ended up with is you've got this thing that's flying around in these very strong winds swaying around um, and then stitching these images together. So I'm not quite sure how successful they will be for dome projection because it's fairly arbitrary the sort of material that you're ending up with. But there are uh, stabilization systems that we're looking at now that, that do horizon detection and so on. So it can point the camera and at, at, at a particular point and we can also uh, do remote control on the camera using uh, sort of little remote controllers from the tip shop as well for controlling toy cars and also get a live camera feed coming down to the ground so we can sort of see what we're pointing at. So this is all sort of work in progress. And the benefit of this is that you can fly things pretty low to the ground as opposed to terrifying penguins and wildlife with helicopters. Um, you're actually constrained by law by the, the, the height that you can go to. But with this is almost virtually silent and we could just be you know, 10 or 15 metres off the ground and the penguins wouldn't notice. And so we got some really nice high resolution imagery of, of wildlife in that sort of context. So those sorts of things are, are important to consider as well if you want to get animals in their natural habitat. Other stuff I was doing was this sort of LiDAR scanning, uh, to, as I mentioned, to, to be able to reconstruct some of the, the models, uh, the, the structures in the environment and still that sort of work in progress as well. And then this thing, the Gigapan system, Paul's got a couple of these. And this is a, an interesting device for doing uh, high resolution scene coverage where you could, the, the large one <coughs> can mount a very large camera like this. It's a much more heavy duty device. And this is the low res one. And basically, what it does is it finds a sphere where it will point, take one photograph, move up, take another one, take another one, and so on, in an arc, and then move along in an arc this way, doing a lap long sort of spherical coverage of the scene, and then you stitch all these together and end up with you know, very, very large panoramas that you, that you can then spherically map and put into a dome and then drive synthetic cameras around in software, essentially points of view in software, but also developed all in other packages 
uh, to generate your particular points of view. And so indeed, that was how um, the initial movie that you saw, the Mawson Tuts thing, uh, was done in uh, Horizon. Well, what we've got is a tripod that takes the mead mount, and the mead mount controls the camera position. <coughs> the tripod sits on a frame, which consists of you know, it's aluminium, and then underneath is one of the keys to the success of this, which is rollerblade wheels of high quality. Only the finest. Only the finest. I think they probably cost about five bucks, which is quite a lot. But it took quite a lot to find them. A lot of effort. Tip shop. Yes, tip yeah. shop ones, of course. And then they run on rails, which are an old bread oven rails. But only the very finest bread oven rails. The finest. Rails. One dollar each. Really? <laughs> we, we really dashed out this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes. So the quality of good enough. And they're welded. You want the trees to weld them so that they are fit, that the joints fit perfectly. And then we have the motive unit, which is <coughs> three eclectic drills, which are this is the driving force, just driven off a 12 volt battery, and this is the gearing arrangement. The gearing arrangement goes down to that which is a roughened wheel, it's roughened with a bit of leather, which drives the <coughs> nylon blind cord string, which doesn't uh, stretch, or it doesn't eat, but not much at this kind of load. And then the pièce de résistance of the whole thing, the really clever bit, really clever, is the automatic stop switch. So you can get a cup of tea. This is that's this thing. The knife switch. Observe. Thank you. All in all, a work of genius, Chris. A work of genius. And art. And art. Together that we collaborated and made this, this, this modern technological masterpiece for a sum total of about $100. About $100.